The boats are moving down the Banana River now, large and small. They moved up there last night, yesterday, and this morning. Several thousand of them have so far come down. They moved up very close to within just a few miles of the Cape Kennedy launch site for Apollo 11. They're now passing underneath the uh, uh, Bennett Causeway. On, on the causeway, traffic has thinned out considerably. At one time, immediately after the launch, there was just a gigantic crush. Almost as soon as the flame went out on the rocket and the rocket went out of sight, the car started up here, this packed area in which all of the campers and the cars had been parked, started to move onto the uh, causeway where they immediately came to a stop. Sir, could I talk to you for a moment? Yes, sir. Who are you, sir? I am Leoncio Flores from Connecticut. We are from, from, from where in Connecticut? Greenwich, Connecticut. Is this the first uh, space shot you've seen? Uh, that's why we came all the way down uh, from Connecticut to watch it. 1,200 miles. Is this a special trip down to see the launch? Nothing, nothing but the space shot, right. Yeah, are you are you going to take a vacation, go on somewhere from here? Well, uh, we plan to spend about a week up, over in North Carolina, but uh, this was our main reason. The main reason was the launch. The space shot, right. What was your impression of it? Well, uh, it's, it's fabulous, uh, the thundering as, as the space shot takes off, and this this emotional moment uh, that uh, you don't know whether it's taking off or or staying on. Uh, I, I think this is the, the crucial moment. Did you have some concern? Yes, I was. Can you, I was uh, can you compare it with anything that you've ever seen or heard of in your lifetime? Oh, God, like when I was getting married or something like that. <laughs> I'm not going to ask your wife for a rebuttal on that. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir, for talking to us. We appreciate it. It is a pleasure. Appreciate your taking the time. Thank you. So now the tourists move off from the uh, causeway, the Bennett Causeway, and go on to continue their vacation, adding a, a very historic moment to what would otherwise be an exciting vacation anyway. And they go on now to their alligator farms and their underwater swimming programs in the sandy beaches of Florida. Floyd Calder, NBC News, reporting from the Bennett Causeway. So he, he said it felt like the day he got married. <laughs> the um, Apollo 11 is now out over the Indian Ocean, approaching the um, western shore of Australia. And as you perhaps know, the uh, crew will make one and a half revolutions of the Earth, and when it comes back over Australia on the next time around, that will be the moment for the decision whether or not to go for the moon. That will be a couple of hours from now. We'll be back in just a moment after this message. It's interesting to realize that uh, almost at the very time that Apollo 11 was being prepared and fueled up uh, earlier this week, the 1970 fiscal year budget for NASA was getting its final treat treatment in the Congress. The Congress, under mandate and political pressure to cut down on federal expenditures, was voting NASA just over $3,900,000,000 for its next year of operation. The lion's share of this money is allocated for the Apollo moon landings, which are expected to continue through 1970, or next year. This program will get $1,691,000,000 compared with $251,000,000 for work on the so-called Apollo Applications Program. This program is the next big project for the space agency, that is, the placing of space stations in Earth orbit so that scientists can work and experiment in space for longer periods of time. The budget allows for a NASA staff of 31,500 people and for 100,000 other indirect employees. Correspondent Roy Neal is standing by at the Space Center in Houston. Roy? The Lunar Receiving Laboratory here at the Manned Spacecraft Center is the place to which the astronauts will be brought after their flight. Along with them, their samples and their pictures of the moon. Manager of the laboratory, Dr. P.R. Bell, is here with me now. And Dr. Bell, it occurs to me that this must be a truly exciting moment for you and your people. Your laboratory is about to come to life. Yes, sir. It is indeed. We're, the launch is going off very well. And our preparations are proceeding properly. Uh, we're all in good state. Those preparations that you mentioned, at this time, what are your people doing? Well, they've been for months now preparing the operations. The people with the plants, for example, have been doing that for a month and a half or so, getting the plants grown that have to be used in these tests. So we're just proceeding up bit by bit, step by step, towards the actual operation, 
which don't start till the 25th. Right, once the astronauts have returned, but what about those people who will be quarantined with them? What's their status this morning? Well, now, that is a little different, because this morning, these people are going into the CRA, and they're essentially in closed quarantine uh, from this morning onward. Why would you lock them up so early, sir? Well, that's to make sure that if any of them are going to come down with the flu or a head cold or something, we find this out well in advance, and they'd get no further exposure to other people than themselves uh, until that time. We don't want to stray cold uh, coming down to make a mess of our problem. Uh, do they have uh, television in that crew receiving area, Dr. Bell? Uh, are they following the flight in other Of course, words? yes, indeed they do. They've got television and radio, and they've got their own telephones in case they want to talk to somebody. So there's no problem there. I see. Now, the lab status itself, sir, can you give us just in broad general terms the intent, the purpose of this place? Well, this, of course, is a basically a quarantine facility with very special and, and important scientific uh, attachments for preliminary examination of the sample. It is facilities really for the sort of pre protection and preservation of the sample as the major parts over and above the quarantine test. So we'll get the samples in, keep them from harm, uh, uh, test them for uh, whether finding out whether there's any pathogens of any sort in them, and then begin the preliminary experiments that must be done because the time is wasting, and hold them there until the end of the quarantine interval when we're sure the pathogens are absent, and then send the material out to principal investigators everywhere, along with what we found out at that time. Now, the question's often been raised, Dr. Bell. Are you really worried on behalf of your people that the astronauts might bring back some strange spore or germ from the moon? Oh, most certainly not. Many scientific people have, have offered to eat the stuff if that would help the situation any, because the probability is quite negligible. But we can't take even a negligible chance since we go ahead and make all the careful preparations and the careful tests as though there were harmful things there. But it's, it's far more risky to cross the street here than it is to, to work in the Lunar Receiving Laboratory, I assure you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We've been talking with Dr. P.R. Bell, whose people at the Lunar Receiving Laboratory are waiting now a long wait for the astronauts to go to the moon and come back, after which the big job will begin at this point on the Manned Spacecraft Center. Frank? We usually trace the origins of the space program back to Russia's launching of the Sputnik in 1958, and uh, that's, that's true, but it's not the entire truth. It actually goes back sometime earlier to a thing called IGY. It stood for International Geophysical Year, and confusion began there because that year ran 18 months long. But as one, just one of the many things that the United States planned to do during that time, and I remember Dr. Joseph Kaplan was chairman of the American Committee for this uh, IGY, and I remember talking to him about it. But just one of the things that we planned to do was to put a satellite into Earth orbit. Um, it had no particular function, really, except to demonstrate that it could be done and to send some signals back. It was a very tiny little instrument package and uh, wouldn't... Uh, wouldn't do much, but we didn't get it up. Uh, Russia, which had not announced such a project as part of um, the Soviet Union's participation in IGY, beat us to the punch with Sputnik. So it really did begin with Sputnik, but in a larger sense, it began earlier with the International Geophysical Year. Uh, they're now 50 minutes into the flight, and about to go over Australia for the first time. Next time around there, they'll decide whether to take off for the moon. And we'll be back. Uh, the crew of Apollo 11 is um, unique. Two of the three members will become, by all present appearances, the first human beings to set foot on another heavenly body. Uh, additionally, they are unusual. Only six men before them have been in the vicinity of the moon. And they also have another minor distinction. They perhaps have been asked more questions than almost anybody in the world politicians included. Uh, for weeks before a flight, they are subjected to an endless stream of questions by people like myself. And uh, it's not an easy chore for them to uh, perform. They're not naturally talkative men, most of them. And the things they do talk about are difficult for the rest of us to understand. But they bear it with great good grace and do as good a job as they can. Uh, none of the men involved in this flight is regarded as uh, an extrovert. Collins does have, and frequently shows, a good and keen sense of humor. 
I was talking with him before the flight in Houston, Texas, and I asked him if he, Collins, could describe the other two members of the crew for me. Let's suppose now that you were talking to somebody who had never seen Armstrong or Aldrin, didn't know a thing in the world about them, mm -hmm. and you wanted to describe them, not physically, but just the kind of guys they are. How would you go about first, say, Armstrong? How would you describe him to such a person? Well, I... Uh... I, I would first describe Neil as uh, as extremely intelligent. I mean, he has, a, I think, what is almost a towering intellect. Uh, it's not uh, immediately apparent when you talk to Neil, but uh, uh, you probe uh, deeply. Uh, hard thing to do with Neil. He likes his own. He has his own barriers erected. But if you probe through those barriers. Uh, You'll find Neil, is, 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 as I say, this is, that's my first impression, most lasting impression, extremely intelligent man.